Welcome to Headroom from the Big Apple. Yours truly has dropped in to bear witness to the largest collection of CEOs from around the world. YPO began in 1950 and to date has 30,000 global members representing 142 countries. The combined workforce of member-run companies exceeds 22 million employees with over $9 trillion in revenues. Join me inside the C-suite. This is Headroom. But the, we were talking sort of off, hit, off air here about the challenges of everybody goes through their own yeah. challenges. They all have their own storyline. And you had a storyline that sort of impacted your educational path. Yeah. That leads you to being on a main stage with the supreme allied commander of NATO. Of NATO right. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you hold two truths that a young person can battle a challenge that is personal and specific and intimate to them yeah. and also hold a dream and an understanding that they can have an impact in a manner that can be motivational, inspiring, and maybe transparent for those listening the next generation? Yeah. Well, we're starting with a pretty deep question. We are. <laughs> um, I, I think an, uh, an adage that's always animated me, but uh, maybe so, sometimes in retrospect, is that Curses are most often seeming curses, and they turn out to be blessings in disguise. And that, just like I opened the conversation with the Admiral by saying smooth seas have never created a great sailor, uh, and you have to sharpen steel with, with steel, you don't pick your adversity, but uh, there's so much strength and meaning in the struggle. Uh, in my case, uh, some people have come to know me for things I've written, including a book. Uh, and they see that I'm academically credentialized. I didn't take a single honors class or AP class in high school. I took the uh, SAT twice. I got a 970 after studying. I was mortified by that score. And I studied another six months and I dramatically improved my score from a 970 all the way to a 980. So I couldn't <laughs> crack a thousand on two tries. But in my case, I grew up with some uh, learning difficulties. I was dyslexic. And I remember being in class in fifth grade, envious of my classmates who were in rapture. They were in the present, in the story. And I didn't have that luxury because I was so scared to be called on. So I would read ahead and I would figure out the algorithm as to when the professor goes to the next student. And I skipped ahead and I kept practicing that area so that when I'm called on, I could read because I didn't have confidence in reading. But think about what comes in that. I was in the moment, and I was on the ceiling of class, figuring out the human dynamics. And then I remember being at family dinners, and my brother and sister were having a joyous time, and I was the one that noticed the cousin that nobody's talking to, and I went and talked to them. And I really felt that the way I, uh, as a blessing, leaned into my challenge, developed other appreciations, maybe more empathy and compassion, but the human condition, and what makes us uh, the spectrum of the, of the human condition is so beautiful and varied that when I found philosophy later on, <laughs> I ran into words and concepts and adages and principles and frameworks. That's kind of, that was my purpose, who I was. Your music. Yeah, my music. Why is it such a rarity? It feels like, as I hear you talk, I feel like we're in a world that everything has to be sort of packaged and there has to be an API and we have to catalog yeah. and organize. And I can't So the first line in my book, which my publisher fought with me. <laughs> but was, you won. Well, I, it's, this is a how book, not a how to book. What's the difference? Everything. Now we know that we love efficiency. You know, four hour work week, four ways to lose four pounds, <laughs> the seven habits of highly successful people especially in the efficiency United States of America, we love being reductionist, yes. reducing big ideas, big challenges to three things, four things, five things, seven things. And here I was telling my readers, you're going to have to work because philosophy and frameworks are not reducible. I'm not going to give you three things, four things. Yeah, it's about great. wrestling. Exactly. It's about going to the gym and not just using software for everything, but building some moral wear. Uh, and I actually think that um, all human judgment is framework dependent. The prevailing framework in business is cost benefit analysis. We specify by law what's legally permitted. Doesn't that strip out the humanity? Of course. Well, it's, and we tell people what they can and can't do. 
And within the bounds and boundaries of what we can and can't do, we use carrots and sticks to incent and motivate and animate people to pursue or, ch or chase goals. That is not, but that's an amoral world, can and can't. Not immoral, amoral. Uh, and it comes from the underlying assumption, straight out of the godfather, that it's not personal, it's just business. Now, if it's just business, then just do it. Too big to fail, my way or the highway. These are actually very rational, cogent strategies if it's just business. If it's just business. Now, I think that was always philosophically misguided because business is human beings coming together to endeavor together. You, business is human endeavor, and you're either going to endeavor well or not, or collaboratively and respectfully or not. And to endeavor on a sustainable basis, you need a beating heart, you need an ethos. So, uh, and the best businesses uh, are human, are not only human endeavor, but they intentionally put humanity and human concerns and hopes and aspirations at the center uh, of the business. But I also think the world now is being reshaped in ways uh, to make uh, the separation between business and life or business and what's personal just elusive. And uh, the business of business right now is community. The business of business is society. We're, we're in a fused world where things that were pushed out of and crowded out of the business agenda, uh, personal, human, religious, environmental, geopolitical, moral, ethical issues, political issues, are now inescapably part of the agenda. Uh, and they hijack your agenda sometime because of somebody else's tweet right. or somebody or some viral video or uh, a CEO doing a layoff on Zoom thinking he or she is doing it thoughtfully and compassionately, yeah. but people are less impressed with the CEO's tears. They want the CEO to be more uh, struck by their tears. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then that goes viral and you get judged by that. So we're operating in a, in a world that hasn't just been accelerated and sped up. We're operating in a world that has been reshaped by unfamiliar forces. How does a kid in fifth grade yeah. who seems to be watching the world go at a different speed in front of him, lean into philosophy, and then- By accident. Take, by accident, and then the next, and then find yourself years later impacting and influencing in a very positive way, and in sort of an eye-opening way, the way in which leaders are operating their businesses and iterating yeah. their products. I mean, what is it internally about your pilot light? So a few things. I can't think of anything more practical uh, and potent and compelling than philosophy, right? I didn't go to school two years in a row until 11th grade. 11th grade is the first year that I showed up in September in the same school that I left for the summer in June. Really? I was switching languages and countries every single year of my life. And that was a product of your- uh... I was not a child of the military. It wasn't that I was growing up in a family that moves. Uh, my mother would visit a city and say, kids, I love it here, let's stay. And then. Uh, she'd say, how about here? And we, it was um, very little of my life what I prescribe as a father. And I'm a loving father now. And it's one of the life's profound paradoxes for me. Thank God it all happened to me and I can't prescribe any of it. I feel blessed and fortunate because I came out the other side and I can't prescribe. I wouldn't move my kids every year. The, the, the powerful relationship as you're talking between a young person that has to, yeah. I mean, literally this forced migration yeah. almost. And where philosophy would almost feel like uh, very, like home. Well, exactly, because when you, um, if you're practical and concrete and day-to-day -day reality is uncertain you and always yourself, shifting, yeah? then I found stability in the world of ideas and in the future, dreams. Almost uh, like the metaverse before the metaverse. That's a beautiful way of putting it. But I, to me, the world of concepts and dreams and future, I feel that the, the, the metaphor that uh, has really framed, I, I, I became the kind of person that takes his shoes, finds a big wall, throws them over the wall, publicly proclaims that I've done that, <laughs> and then I say to people, I gotta go find my shoes. And that, I would say things, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. But I uh, fell in love with entrepreneur, my friend Ruben Sloan and I, we uh, detailed Lionel Richie's cars every Saturday <laughs> for, uh, for high school in the first year of college. Uh, I wanted to be self-made. I didn't have any money. And he paid us $50 a car, 25 each. And I put the money aside. 
And the, and the story, this is a true story, Ruben got into UCLA and I only got into UC Santa Barbara. And I felt that I was put on earth to have some impact. And even though I had a low GPA and a, and a low SAT, I applied to University of Pennsylvania and to Stanford and I got rejected by both immediately. <laughs> but I felt that they should take me and they did not. Yeah. And after three days of going through orientation at UC Santa Barbara, I looked around and it's an amazing school, but I, something compelled me to pack up and drive back to Los Angeles and write UCLA a two page letter pleading hardship. And I basically said, here's what I'm about and my investment to being self-made. And you've admitted uh, Ruben, my car detailing partner, and I need to stay in Los Angeles to continue to detail Lionel Richie's cars with Ruben. And I'm pleading with you to let me in and I'm already in the UC system. Can you create a hardship transfer? And they did. They did. Under one condition, that I would enroll in remedial English. Because that's how low my English was. So I started UCLA in remedial English and a moral philosophy class. And where were you born? San Francisco. You were born in San Francisco. I wound up in Israel at the age of three. So uh, you were born just in San learning Francisco. all these different languages. Right now. First grade, uh, kindergarten, Tel Aviv. First grade, San Francisco. Second, Jerusalem. Third, San Francisco. Fourth, Tel Aviv. Fifth, Jerusalem. Sixth, Tel Aviv. Seventh, uh, every year. Wow. Actually, seventh, Tel Aviv. Sixth, Jerusalem. I moved every year of my life, like that. And, um, and, I did, and there I was in moral philosophy, and I found... And at some point, I had a tenacious love affair with it. I was reading footnotes of what these philosophers were saying about each other and about their It was work. a love affair. Yes. And at some point, I stopped being a student of philosophy. I started to do philosophy, to philosophize, to... It was an intellectual way and discipline for me. I'd sit at cafes. I actually freed myself from the how much world. I wasn't ready for exams because I pulled an all-nighter or studied 24 hours. I was ready because I understood the material. I started to feel detached from time. If I could sit at a cafe with these philosophy PhD students and we understood each other, I was ready. And I think that's the person you saw on stage today. That if, was the person I saw on stage. If it was clear to me, I'm ready to go. If I thought it through, or if it comes from the heart, if I'm passionate about it. Because I'm not, I don't memorize anything. It's And again, when you think about being dyslexic and sort of the, maybe the lack of traditional organization in the way in which you process information. If I go to movies, you can show, you can show me any bit actor and I could put him in five other movies immediately. Any bit actor. It's yeah. visual. <laughs> it's a whole different way. But, uh, but I actually came out of the other side of philosophy. I finished UCLA with a bachelor's and a master's at the same time. And then I went on to graduate school and I studied two more years of philosophy. And then when I got to law school, I took nine jurisprudence classes, which is philosophy of law. And I taught undergraduates. And, um, and the, the, the journey of, and then I, uh, I founded LRN. And over the years, LRN about, had about 20 some different conference rooms. Every one of them was named after a moral philosopher. Because <laughs> remember, I was, a, I was a street kid. These are your and heroes I, in that way, yeah, right? Yeah, and I was a street kid. So I, I wanted to bring philosophy to the rough and tumble world, to the gray. Some, some people with that background, they end up writing music or they find ways to communicate their experience so, yeah, through the art. Yeah, there's a book on dyslexia and, uh, called The Dyslexic Advantage. And most dyslexics, they go in the other way and all the AP, A students work for them. I was, uh, it's, what's, what was, what struck people who study dyslexics is that I ran back into the fire and tried to master academia and intellectualism. Yeah, you didn't run from it. I went right in towards it, towards that. I'm saying, I'm going to go to these good schools and figure it out. But I noticed that some of the students around me were incredibly ambitious. They got 99, they got straight A's their whole life. And I started to feel very different. We might have looked similar from the outside. They were ambitious, constructively so, and many of them committed to uh, deploy their ambition towards good. But I felt that I was hungry. Hungry. Hungry, not ambitious. There's, there a was a, there's a difference. It's, you're not reflexive. You're, not, you're on your own mission. You're on your own journey. There's a fire. How do you understand success in the, when we think about traditional ways to celebrate achievement? I would think that you would have a different lens when you think about so to or me, experience it. I, I, well, I'm trained in philosophy, so I love paradox. The, the paradox of happiness is central to my life, that if you pursue it, it eludes you. 
but if you are uh, passionately animated uh, uh, towards being other regarding, not self regarding, some contribution to the world, anything associated with progress, solving a problem, something worthy, uh, and you pursue that in a meaningful way and it's a source of meaning, then happiness can find you. Now in business, I've, I've created a corollary to that. It's the, it's the paradox of success. That if you pursue success conventionally defined, uh, increasingly it will elude you in this world today. It didn't used to, but now it eludes you. But if you pursue significance, uh, if you don't just sell products, but you serve in some way as a business, uh, then business success can find you. And I think that's been central to how I frame. Uh, I also feel that it's important to have the courage to frame the future as a journey. Because we know in life that life is a journey. We celebrate that about life. And we are taught to, to fall down and get back up, to zig and zag. All the message we get about our life is get really good at going up and down, right? Let's keep we going. Do. Yeah. Forge ahead. Chase the, get lost, get confused, and come back. And then in business, we go, business isn't a journey. We love linearity. All profits need to go straight up and misconduct straight down. And through budgeting and planning and control, we decide that business, even though it's about human beings working hard to do something worthy, business should be a, li a linear path. Headroom is produced by Old Soul, a one-stop marketing agency that understands the power of brand and nuance. Reach out to my guy, Matt, at Old Soul and supercharge your brand and content strategy. That's Old Soul. Shoot Matt a note at aoldsoul.com. That's A-O-L-D-S-O-U-L.com. And now, back to our guest. So how do we understand or plug your way of thinking into the next generation? Because whether it's our species, whether it's just our destiny, but you know, we're very good at repeating <laughs> the same things over and over again, yeah. even when we see it in front of us, whether it's, it's uh, the success and failure of marriage or business or restaurants. Or, we Tell see me why Jalen Ross, the best Alabama uh, wide receiver, maybe in high school Alabama history, an Alabama superstar, high, high school national athlete, should have gone to play for Nick Saban at the University of Alabama. He went to Georgia and played at Clemson for Dabo Sweeney because, this is explicit, of their philosophy of love. You know, as I said earlier, leadership is about trend lines. And if you step back, there's not a single Fortune 500 company being run by an autocratic command and control CEO. And you know the stereotypical CEOs from the past, Chains, Chainsaw, Al Dunlap, no. okay? Find me one of those running a Fortune 500 company today. Name one autocratic mayor. Name a championship one in any major sport, hockey, baseball, basketball, football, European soccer, with that stereotypical, shouting, tyrannical coach. So I can't. I can't, <laughs> right? Yeah. Name a coach winning who sees X's and O's as their player, because moral leadership begins and ends with who you see. If you're a media company, you're in media, and you see a consumer of news, what are you going to do? You'll build a business model to get them to consume your news. And then your news will become newsy and engaging. And the opposite of, of, of significance to your point. Yes. But if you see a consumer and you want to be in fidelity to that, you'll give them the truth and reliable information so they can practice citizenship. But look at the language we use to describe the other, a user. And then if they're a user, why won't I addict them? If they're a consumer, I'll get them to consume. Employees are, are cost centers. I thought human beings are assets. If they're a cost. Language is powerful. I learned that in philosophy. Words get at concepts and concepts get at reality. And Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language are the limits of my imagination. And that's what on stage today I said, you can shift people or elevate them, right? That's a, that was a charge. Are you going to go shift your people and nudge them or elevate them? So are we teaching the, duh, I'll call it the dove method, right? For a lack of a better phrase here, but, or label. You know, in my, in the LRN, the company that I founded, sales executives, you know what their title was? <laughs> no. Enlistment executives. Enlistment. Because sales, you tell somebody, I can sell ice to Eskimos. You sell. Sell. But you're going to behave different if you're told to be a great salesman. But if your title says enlist, 
and then we translate that word into an ethos to invite in to a partnership or relationship. So I've used my entire career uh, philosophically constructed words to walk my fine line. Are we sharing this with young people in formalized education? Are we, or are no. we cheating ourselves? Well, Aristotle said that educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And sadly, I don't think with, uh, there's enough emphasis on educating the heart and the humanities and philosophy. Literature is where we learn to extend sympathies to others. But, and um, I think there's a failure to realize that increasingly machines are being programmed to put us out of business in terms of doing the next thing because right. Because we've been teaching all of us as humans to act like the machines totally. for generations. Yeah. It's, it's the irony when I, I normally wouldn't share this on a podcast, but I'll share it as we're talking yeah. now because of your transparency, but I guess lecture at Vanderbilt's business school, I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm always amazed and I enjoy what working. What do you do at Vanderbilt again? So I, I guess lecture with their it, business, yeah. right? Sure. But, but you know what I do, Duff? I basically strip down what they've been taught. And what my focus is, is about the energy in the room yeah. and understanding that they are right. not students anymore. Right. They are a part of, I mean, this is, this is a community. Totally. The, but the, the irony is the looks on their faces, every cohort, it's like yeah. they have not had this conversation through but think years about of education. But, but think of societal messages. Google said, do no evil. And when they proclaim that, they were the good guys. All they promised is they would be one step short of evil. <laughs> but think of where we wound up. Where promising to not do evil puts it's a you... good thing. Is to be applauded. It's a floor. Yeah. That's a floor treated as a ceiling. That's where we were. You know, I'm all about the how, but Boston should say, just do it, I don't care how. I mean, don't get caught child, hiring child labor or doing something stupid. Other right. than that, just do it. Are and we getting closer to where... You're the LRN and what basically you, the essence of you, is embraced without question because we Listen, have... Listen, I'm BE. I'm before Enron. <laughs> B, I, I'm a BE guy. And there was no wind in my sails. Literally, bosses no. would say, just do it. I don't care how. Imagine saying, I don't care how today. Oh, it doesn't resonate. So the, it's things, now there's wind in the sails. It's a short runway. So more people are on the path, but they need the frameworks. ERP, CSR, CRN. TQM, HRIS, what do all these acronyms stand for? <laughs> what I love about business is business wants to do things at scale. To do things at scale, you need to be systematic. And to be systematic, you have to have a framework and the ability to measure against the framework because what we measure is what we get. I think the next frontier, the next frontier is a systematic approach to elevated human conduct, to, to normative behavior. Human to, conduct. Conduct, inspired conduct, thoughtful conduct, all the things that make us human but we need to be framework based because uh, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is, is better than doing the wrong thing, but it doesn't scale. And it is very timely because we're obviously in an era of branding. You know, I mean, it's just so interesting. I mean, you'll think of branding. Chevron is the human energy personal, company. I should have said branding. It, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's also a problem. Not corporate branding, but this, you know, historically, if you were a part of General Motors, you were part of that brand. You weren't you weren't now you're on the LinkedIn, expert, yeah. right? Now you're on LinkedIn, and it's but that not worries me. I'll tell you why. In the in the in the conventional kind of more materialistic economy, human beings love to stand out and be noticed. Where did where did the expression conspicuous consumption come from? But to do to uh, succeed in conspicuous consumption, you have to work pretty hard to afford the Ferrari or the Porsche or the do, cashmere yeah. sweater, and you typically have to turn forty to afford those things. Now I think we're in an era of what I call conspicuous expression. Explain. You stand out by what you just tweeted or, uh, or so an expression is very inexpensive and it's available to you as a teenager. So what's constant is our need to stand out and be noticed. But now we're standing out, not through our stuff, but through our expressions. And I think that's very dangerous because in the age of celebrity, you get followership for anything that makes you a celebrity, good or bad. And we're seeing that. And in the... In, and Narcissus, I'm a father and I want my kids to have self-regard and self-love. Narcissus did not love himself, he loved his image. And there's a lot of people out there in this era of conspicuous expression curating some public image. And, I, and that's creating uh, you know, some very harmful dynamics in society.
What advice would you have, Dove, for the early, maybe CEO, early career executive that for whatever reason is in pursuit of the answer? Yeah. And in relation to your, your philosophy, yeah. but because a philosopher to me is not really in search of an answer. Like that, that's counter to the expression, the experience of being able to hold multiple truths at one time yeah. and sort of understand context and application to oneself and one being. How do you understand the pursuit of an answer when we it's in, we're institutionalized to find the answer, whether it's with the SAT well, you, or it's... You, <laughs> so you have to make it a team sport. And then the leader can help frame the conversation that together allows you to wrestle with the answer. And language matters. You can come to a meeting and have a great conversation. And then at the end of the meeting, you go, whose call is it? That's a power question. Whose call? Just say, okay, it's been a great conversation. What do we think is the right call? Same conversation. Why end it with whose call? Oh, that's a marketing decision. Who's got the marketing budget? You just ruined a one-hour conversation by saying whose call is it? See what Wasted it. Wasted. The leader has the power to say, what's the right call? What's the fair call? The, the, that's not philosophy. That's just... What I'm saying is, is one more practical than the other? It's not like whose call is somehow faster than what's the right call. But the leader needs to take responsibility for emphasizing rightness as opposed to power. Whose call? Let's take empowerment. And everybody is embracing empowerment. And how can you not? It's the right spirit. But here's what it looks like in, in action. I delegate decisions. I push decisions to the front lines. So now, everybody knows what rights they have. I have a right to spend $1,000. I have a right to spend $5,000 without asking my boss. So everybody, you're just a kinder, gentler version of what you were before. Everybody has more rights, and everybody fights for their rights and knows what their rights are. But nobody knows what is right. You just know what rights they have. You haven't p created a gym to build the ethos. What's the right way here? So... Philosophy taught me that. That's a, empower, people are making philosophical errors at scale by thinking that good leadership is delegating. You want to do, show up and ask a question and don't give the answer. Delegating makes you, this is beneath me. I don't even have to go to this. So do you see how I used philosophy to not spend four years thinking that this approach to empowerment is going to be good for us? Because you wake up five years later and everybody's empowered and you have chaos. Let's... Let's, so it's practical. It's very practical. Let's close with this, Dove, and you've been incredibly kind with your time. Paint the picture for me as to what being philosophical has afforded you to enjoy as a member of planet Earth in a way where you can, because I go, I think back to that, that 10 year old that fifth grader I, I think that, that was on the outside looking yeah. in because it feels as if like when we talk about you're talking about sports and football you hear when a quarterback or an athlete says life slow it slows down on the field and that's when they accelerate their talent and they sort of yeah, there's yeah, this yeah. actualization you can feel things more deeply yeah. you can appreciate meaning you can appreciate meaning in the struggle sometimes meaning comes from the lack of euphoria but in the struggle uh, the other is a sense of perspective. You can hover above. We think that Uber or Lyft putting some yellow taxi cabs out of business, disruption, we use the word revolutionary too freely. We had a scientific revolution 500 years ago. That was a real revolution. It sent us back to the drawing board. We had to rethink everything when we figured out if the sun revolves around the earth or the other way around. And think of what was catalyzed since the scientific revolution. Biodiversity, Thomas Paine wrote Man's Bill of Rights, uh, Adam Smith was not an economist. He was the chairman of the moral philosophy department at Glasgow University when he wrote the Capitalist Manifesto, The Wealth of Nations. Modern democracy was invented. But what did we call that last 500 years? It was like uh, revenge of the nerds, right? It was uh, the <laughs> enlightenment, the, a the age of reason. Because human beings want to be on top of the food chain and we want to be the best. And we looked around and we said, oh, we're the smartest. So we in the last 500 years created enormous progress and prosperity and brought people out of poverty and innovated and solved problems and are living doubly as long with our heads, right? With our heads. 
Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And you know what philosophy afforded me to do? We're living through a technological revolution right now that it happens every 500 years. And it's sending us back to our drawing boards because we no longer get to say that we're on top of the food chain and we're the best because we're the smartest because our monopoly on intelligence is not secure because we're in the age of intelligent machines. So we now have to go back to the drawing board and ask a very deep philosophical question. What does it mean to be human in the age of intelligent machines when the answer can't be we're the smartest? That's, a, that's going on right now. And I think business has a lot to say about that at the forefront. Now, so what does a human being have that a machine doesn't have and will never have a heart? The machine can't ask why, right? So I think that we're, we've gone from a, an industrial age where we hired hands and we could have hired wimpy hands, we went for strength, to a knowledge economy, we could have scaled uh, idiocy and ignoramuses, we said no, knowledge, specialization, wisdom, expertise. Now we're in a human economy where we have to enlist and inspire and hire hearts. Now we could go for rage and jealousy and anger, the heart's capable of that, or we could go for the, what makes us human at our best, caring, compassion. And I think that's the next frontier. That, that's the question we're all wrestling with whether we know it or not. And, and business today in this fused world has to not just proclaim its humanity and say work here and buy from us and invest in us because we're human. You have to translate that proclamation into into humanity. And what makes us human deep down, I think, is our capacity for ethics. Our capacity for doing the right thing is really having a good heart is what makes us human. But to me, that's a practical question because right now, business and every institutional leader in the world has to somehow embody and manifest that. You've expanded, hopefully, what I will uh, retain is a capacity to ask deeper, more thoughtful questions to elicit a conversation that has meaning beyond the technology that is recording this right now. It's incredibly powerful what you're doing. You've got a, you have a new fan in me in, oh, uh, in wanting to know more about your continued journey because I think you, you've, you've hit it on the head of where we are, what we need to do, and that we are back at the drawing board. Yeah. And it's going to take thoughtful leaders and more importantly humans like yourself to ask the questions that give us pause and to live in the moment. Thank you, Dove. It's a pleasure. Thanks for taking the plunge into Headroom, where we uncover the why behind the what and who impacting our lives. Headroom is a production of Rainlight and co-produced by our friends at Old Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and this is Headroom. <laughs>